Okay, everybody, the show is about to begin, and I feel the desire to invite people hanging out over there. There's a, f a few seats left. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Oh, dear. Dan, did you hear that? You definitely need Dan Cortis tonight. Well, listen, tonight is going to be fantastic. Um, you are going to be part of a collision. Two things are going to collide. It's not Dan and me, I hope. Actually, it's going to be philosophy and science. Uh, what an interesting point in life in which we live when we have artificial intelligence, which we think as engineers we might get very excited about. But I think what Dan Cortis is going to reveal for us tonight is maybe some of the implications not only those that are technical, but philosophical, maybe even more. So this discovery that we will do together is going to be that into a world of artificial intelligence, machine learning and beyond, which is very exciting. And the reason why it's so important uh, for us to bring you here today is we, we believe as a company at Qualitans that it's so important to bring people together and to talk about ideas because I don't think there's a bigger idea right now in the world that could have more impact to change not only our lives but industry itself. There is no idea bigger than that of artificial intelligence. So this is part of a program in which we're inviting all of you to be part of, which is called Future Horizons, which is all about talking about technologies that are gonna have dramatic impact in how we work, how we live, and how we actually decide to create the future is an opportunity that we have right now together. So does that sound fun to entertain Do I need a to technology that might transform my, the my world? Mic, on. Are you guys excited about this idea? Are you, as you start to absorb the possibilities, are you ready to welcome Dan Cordes? Because he's a very shy young man. <laughs> you know, he might have professor at the front of his name, but you know, he needs to feel the love if you want him to create this collision of concepts. So I need to check, are you ready for Professor Dan Cortis from Georgetown University? Yes. Oh. So with no further ado, I give to you, Mr. Dan Cortis. Marketing people, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And uh, I'd like to, I'm always happy uh, speaking in front of the team and uh, their guests. For that, I would like to thank you, the management. Uh, Juan Jacob and uh, Radu Constantinescu, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a number of times. And for being forward-looking and uh, like kind of the discussions. Uh, I've noticed another change since the previous years. The drinks were at the end of the talk, now are at the beginning. That's great, because at, after a while, it doesn't matter what I say, you are going to be all happy. So that was done probably for me. All right, so <clears throat> uh, this is a very vast subject. And um, you know, I'm going to try to cut through in such a way that we're going to stay within the allocated time. Um, but I would like to, you know, the subject as, as you saw here, is correlation, causation, and Bayesian networks. But it is part of a series of presentations I have about the philosophical uh, co considerations and uh, what's happening here. Looks like it, it got out of sync. I have a, a series of presentations uh, about philosophical consideration in artificial intelligence. Tonight, we're going to focus on that. but. As an uh, introduction notes, I would like to set the stage a little bit about why are philosophical considerations important in um, artificial intelligence. From the beginning of the uh, advent of artificial intelligence, which was not too far ago, you know, maybe 60, 70 years ago, right at the end of the Second World War, when uh, they invented the digital computers, uh, you would have People like Alan Turing, the very famous um, British scientist, 
uh, who came up with uh, the, what people call the computational theory of mind, together with Alonso Church, another uh, scientist of that time, and uh, which says that basically the mind is computational. In other words, the, you, we can represent the mind in the computer. And that was the basis of the beginning of what people are doing in artificial intelligence. So just from the beginning, there are a serious implication in terms of philosophical implications. You, you look at this. Just a simple say, the mind is computational. What that implies that the mind and the brain are the same. And once we can represent the brain structure on the computer, we will be able to represent the mind. Well, a lot of computer scientists, and probably among you, they are taking that for granted. Well, it's not. It's a serious, very serious implication, which is implicit from the philosophy that the mind is equivalent with the brain. Uh, by the way, there are there is a whole slew of courses about the theory of the mind. And uh, some people agree that the mind and brain are, are the same. Some people don't. So it's a lot of debate. So uh, this is just the beginning. Pretty much everything which we're going to see in artificial intelligence has a number of implications and about philosophical assumptions. And uh, they're not always explicit. That reminds me of... Uh, Monsieur Jourdain, remember Monsieur Jourdain from Moliere's Le Bourgeois Gentillon. What did he say? He became rich and he you know, got a professor for rhetoric and the professor taught him that what he is talking about is the prose. And he said, darn me, I was speaking prose for 40 years and I didn't know. Well, that's what's happening with us. When we talk about artificial intelligence, we are making assumptions about philosophical assumptions, and some of them are implicit, some of them are not, but we do that. So, now I'd like a small introduction about human beings. Not much, about human beings. Human beings are weird people, weird, very weird. Humans are not satisfied according to their nature. They just don't. I mean, what I mean by that is most of the other species, you know, they are acting according to their nature, you know, fish, swim, the birds are flying, uh, I don't know, herbivores are eating herbs and carnivores are eating uh, herbivores and so on and so forth. But not the humans. If we compare the humans with uh, other species, it seems like humans always wanted to overcome their conditions, to go beyond their nature, to become transhumans, to become like gods. Now, as you will see, the term transhumanist right now, it's very much connected with artificial intelligence. But the idea of the transhumans, it's way, way beyond, before the, the technology. In fact, there is a very uh, uh, word in the Greek mythology, hubris. Greek mythology, is that still taught in school, Greek mythology? That's good. That, then you know what hubris is. It's the foolish pride challenging the gods. Well, look, Prometheus, well, he wanted to challenge the gods, to give fire and knowledge to people. The gods didn't like that. Icarus and Daedalus, they wanted to go beyond, you know, whatever humans are doing. They wanted to fly. And it was not enough to fly. Icarus said, I'm going to fly higher and higher toward the sun. You know what the gods do? The gods are punishing them. The, the, the goddess of justice, Nemesis, always punish them, but we never learn, we humans. You, you'll see why, because this is the same thing. You know, if we fast forward a few thousand years, we go to the 18th and the 19th century, and we have the scientific and industrial revolution. And what people do? They do something about transhumans. They said, we don't have enough power. And they invented through science an augmented human power, you know, like steam machines combustion engines, uh, like electrical motors. And you would say, this is good enough. No, we, we are not happy. They wanted to say, we are going to go and challenge the gods. And they did nuclear power. And we survived. It's not if we are going to survive, but so far we did. So it's pretty good. Now, 
We are now with this hubris at the next level. It is uh, uh, not enough that we were able to go beyond the, the physical powers, but now humans, they want to go beyond the cognitive powers. So look at what is happening. It's the information revolution. With the invention of digital computers and artificial intelligence, they want to challenge the guy again and create artificial super intelligence. So nobody is happy enough. OK, we have something we can implement in the computer. We are getting close to what people do. And in some areas, they are doing better. The computers are calculating faster, solving differential equations. No, 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 no. We are going to challenge. We are going to create artificial intelligence equivalent with the human mind. And beyond, we are going to create something which is bigger. It's going to be artificial super intelligence. You know, this guy, Stuart Brand, he said, we're as gods, and we might as well get good at it. So hubris has a significant component of boasting. So I'm here to try to balance. You are going to hear a lot of hype. And a lot of people are, uh, there is a lot of artificial intelligence. And there are celebrities like to hype. And in general, celebrities like to hype. But what's new is people who are scientists, they are, they are getting into, into the hype. Now, uh, Stephen Hawking, he just uh, recently deceased. But before, he had serious concerns about uh, artificial intelligence. And he, you know, people are talking about how this artificial super intelligence is going to come, is going to take over. And a lot of people talk about that. Elon Musk, fundamental of human civilization. Uh, Bill Gates in the same, uh, Zuckerberg is, uh, Zuckerberg is supposedly a little bit more uh, on the, the positive side, but people are hyping, people are creating this idea that artificial super intelligence is very, very, and they are going to take over. Where, where is this idea coming from? Why people are talking about that? Well, this is coming from transhumanists. There are a number of transhumanists, and these are some of the famous names, Werner Vinge, Ray Kurzweil, and uh, people who developed this concept of technological singularity. So what is this concept of technological singularity? Well, it goes along what I just described in artificial intelligence. You start with some aspects of artificial intelligence people are developing. Slowly, we are getting to the point of artificial general intelligence, like the human mind. And if you get to that point, then you can imagine a machine with artificial intelligence, which is called artificial general intelligence at the level of the humans, which is able to design machines themselves and design, like humans, better machines all the time. But the difference is that the machines have significant better uh, hardware capabilities than the human brain. Look at, look at what's happening. I mean, you have a computer which is billions of times faster than the way the neurons are acting in our, in our brain. And the memories are, you know, gigabytes. We, we don't have so much, but we have something else, we, the, 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 the brain. So the point is that people said the moment you got to the point of artificial general intelligence, that is when the machines can accelerate this cycle, develop new and uh, newer machines and better, but significantly faster because they have more resources and eventually you are going to end up with what records will, uh, in fact, Werner Vinge invented this terminology, get to the technological singularity, which is this point where this artificial intelligence, it is so high, so different from what we are as humans, that is going to be a brand new, new world. The, the concept, the singularity, comes from mathematics. Singularity is something which is a discontinuity. It's hard. You cannot predict what's, what's there. So that created a lot of people being worried about that. What's happening with that? So, well, <laughs> this is the concept. This is what uh, transhumanists are saying. Uh, just kind of an aside, uh, I, uh, I presented that last year for people who were here. You know, I described the transhumanists. It's, it's a very popular thing right now in the world. But in the United States, it's, it's really big. It's a powerful intellectual and social movement that exudes great optimism and belief in this convergence of all this robotics, nanotechnology, genetics, artificial intelligence, and all this are going to create this 
extraordinary new things that are going to help create a bright new future where humans will not only solve economic problems and cure diseases, but they will prolong life and a lot of things, you know, are going to prolong life almost indefinitely. They, but some people talk about immortality because you can download your personality on, on silicon and if you do that, you can create backup copies and so on and so forth. So it, it, it took off. This hype, it took off a lot. So in general, transhumanism is related to artificial intelligence because the people are looking at what's happening in artificial intelligence and say, what these people are claiming makes sense. Look at the developments in, in the artificial intelligence. So just look at some of them. This is just some of the commercial applications. Uh, language translation services, you go to Google and get not a perfect translation, but you get some. Uh, translated telephone, speech recognition and synthesis, you know, uh, song recognition, image recognition. These are all recent developments, due my, uh, especially to machine learning. Uh, and uh, for instance, everybody question answering, everybody has, you know, Siri, Alexa. Siri, you ask a question and it comes back with something which is meaningful, is grammatically correct. Well, this is in English. If it would be in Romanian, gram grammatics is so complicated that people have trouble. Look at some prime ministers here. So, <laughs> uh, so maybe, maybe I don't know. I didn't, never tried that in Romanian. It's easy in English. The English, gram English grammar, it's, it's easy. But basically, look, look, at, look at how many of these, of these applications. Basically, everywhere you, you look around and you see aspects of artificial intelligence. Now, it's a very, very important point. What is common to all the applications I'll show, I'll show you? What's common is something, we're going to introduce some terminology now. It's, they are all something which is called narrow AI or specialized artificial intelligence. So you see, none of this are what transhumanists believe is necessary to go to the super intelligence. They are not artificial general intelligence. They are not like humans. Well, yes, they are doing better than humans in some aspects, but you know, better than humans is not a big deal. Look at the, look at the eye of the eagle, uh, going faster. So specific things, it doesn't mean that we are closer to being like humans. And uh, says that artificial general intelligence is not yet achieved. So the path to what these people talk about singularity is artificial intelligence, narrow applications. You have to get to artificial And then as I described, these people believe the transhumanity that you can get to artificial super intelligence and that's where the hype is. Well, you know, People used to say that there is a saying in English, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The road to artificial superintelligence is paved with philosophical assumptions. Not all of them are explicit. This is the point I'm trying to make. I'm trying to present as opposed to hype. I, I'm not saying that the hype is all bad. There are some aspects of it. But it, it, many times it could send the wrong signal that we are already there, you have to be worried because especially curse oil, it's, it's so, you know, pushing that in our lifetime we might see artificial super intelligence. Let, let go back and see what needs to happen before we are going to get there. So remember this is very important. This is a chain, artificial intelligence, general intelligence, artificial super intelligence. So, now, I, the goal of this presentation is not to go through it. We might have another one in detail. These are very complex things. These are very high level philosophical assumptions about artificial intelligence, which have to do with, I mentioned some of the mind equivalent with Brehm, computational theory of mind, as I mentioned before. I want just to tell you that there are objections to it. A lot of philosophers and mathematicians and physicists, they are against, Lucas Penrose is against, uh, you know, what people say, yeah, 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 I, I understand what you say, but you see, these computers are doing something which is syntactic versus semantic. What means syntactic? I mean, you give a set of rules, you look at that, and you, according to the rules, you can answer. People say, oh, this is good. Uh, there is an American philosopher, John Searle, which has a very interesting um, thought uh, experiment. He calls it the 
Chinese room thought example. He said, I'm John Searle, and I don't know Chinese. But I'm in a room. I have computers and books and everything else. And somebody gives me, in Chinese, some signs asking questions. And I don't understand any Chinese, but I go look at the signs, and I know the rules, how to do that, and I answer in English. And people say, oh, yeah, this is a good, correct answer. This is good. But I have no idea. I'm not Chinese. I, did not, I do not understand Chinese. That's his point as a thought example. That that's what basically computers are doing. They are doing syntactic analysis, which could be extraordinarily sophisticated, but not semantics. So, and these are, you know, we talked about mind uploading. There are so many philosophical assumptions for mind uploading. People skip over and say how we're going to download, upload the mind, and put it on silicon and send it into space. We need to colonize the space forever, everyone by having brains on silicon. Well, I'm not going to go through that now. And I, uh, I just wanted to mention, because look at these are all very, very difficult philosophical assumptions at which there are all kinds of points of view. Brain functions, functions are not computable, as I mentioned before. We'll never solve the hard problem of consciousness. Nobody knows, actually, let's be honest. Nobody knows what consciousness is. There are all kinds of theories and models, but nobody knows yet. So, uh, binding problem, that's another one. Intelligence depends on the substrate. By the way, people, some people are just flippingly saying, we can take the consciousness on silicon. Well, there is no life which we know of, which is not based on carbon. So we don't know if life and intelligence could exist on a different substrate. Uh, this is a very deep thing which you, know, you need to, to go through. Uh, and then there is something else with philosophers. I don't know if you are familiar with the, the Cartesian dualism. This is a part in philosophy in which Descartes, 500 years ago, came up with this idea that the, the we, uh, we are like the spirits in the machine, you know, like there is a spirit and, you know, the body is a machine and the spirit is the one which creates intelligence and everything else. Well, when you talk about downloading from your uh, brain on a silicon, it means implicitly that you believe in Cartesian dualism. And I'm telling you, 80% of the philosophers would jump on you and say, that's not true. 500 years arguing against it. Anyhow. So, you know, we can never show it words, it's unethical, and so on and so forth. So, that, this was just a quick introduction, because our, what I'm trying to do today is to go to something more specific, because I would like to show to something which it's missing toward the path toward getting artificial general intelligence. And uh, I, I mentioned that. So, if you look at this, it, we talked about the path between uh, uh, from AGI to ASI, but what I'm saying, oh, and this is another, is not hype. These guys are doing e extraordinary work, but there is some hype in this. That, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn it off, so I will do it right now. <clears throat> so, uh, what is deep mind? Anybody knows what deep mind is? Oh. DeepMind, uh, let me tell you, DeepMind is a company which was uh, you know, fairly recently acquired by Google. It's a company in which uh, they work on artificial intelligence. This is an extraordinary collection of high-level PhDs in computer science and many, many other fields. And they did some remarkable things in the last two years or so. They, they created a machine artificial intelligence software which works uh, with Atari games and created extraordinary performance very quickly get to the master level and then super master level and then uh, they started working against people the best people in in the go the, the chinese game go and they achieved extraordinary successes there and so on and so forth so it's it's very lots of real successes using an uh, one uh, a number of algorithms and machine learning related to the so-called the deep learning part and People immediately say, oh, this, we are getting closer. Look at, they got to superhuman performance, which means we are getting closer to artificial general intelligence. 
Well, it's not quite so, and I'm not going to go and, and uh, you know, talk them down because they are, they are very good at what they are doing. I'm just saying that these are not necessarily things which are going to bring us closer to artificial intelligence, general artificial intelligence. These are still narrowed, specialized uh, code. Um, what's missing here, it, the difference between you know, these are using all machine learning is basically function-based algorithms. You know, they are fitting some data. What's missing, it's an essential thing which is called causality. And the point I'm trying to make is that if we don't understand causality, and you will see right now, it's a, it's a pretty confusing concept, uh, we are not going to be able to make uh, progress in... Uh, in uh, getting artificial general intelligence. You know, like the rooster's crow is highly correlated with the sign rise. It does not cause the sign rise. Well, you don't know that from the correlations. We'll get there right now. So, what I'm talking about is this hype. When you talk about that all these specialized things which I presented before, can we answer these questions in the affirmative? Can we say that this kind of success justifies claim that we have figured out a way to formalize common sense? Uh, does it justify claims that we can now comprehend language or speech and actually understand it, not just mimic it? The answer is no. So clearly we have a way to go toward AGI. So what's missing is the development of causal based models as opposed to just correlation models. So now we're going, so we're done with the introductory part, we're going to the main part of the, uh, what we're trying to present. Correlation and causation. They are not the same. Intuitively, correlations are associated with causality. However, they are even useful even in the absence of causal relationship. Like, for instance, you have symptoms of illness which are, uh, you know, vital in arriving at the diagnosis. Indicators may presage a recession, and so on and so forth. Uh, a student, for instance, declaring grade, grades could be a sign of something. So we get markers which are correlated with symptoms. Now, in each of these cases, one or more markers can be used to identify an underlying condition, but changing the marker this is correlation. It doesn't change the cause because we don't know the cause. Correlation doesn't tell you what the cause is. For instance, if you look at the fever, give them uh, pills against the fever, the fever is going to go lower, but maybe has an infection. So you actually need to find a way to get causal understanding, not only correlation. So uh, the point is, it's a very tricky thing. Correlations and causation are, are pretty confusing. There are aspects where uh, people don't care about causation. It doesn't care, they don't care if there is a cause. Look at this. You, let's say you work for an um, insurance company. And uh, there is a model of car. And you've noticed from correlations that this car has more accidents than others. Now, the causes could be very different. It could be that maybe it appeals to young people when they create accidents because they feel like they are immortal, you know, going 200 miles an hour. Or it could be something wrong with the car. So even if they don't understand the car, bit, they don't care. They say, we are going to charge more for this car just from correlation studies because I don't care what's causing it. I know that it's causing some problems. So there are aspects where correlation doesn't need causation. Um, whatever the explanation is, you know, for them it's, it's okay. So, now, the causation is it's pretty confusing. I, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but I just wanted to give you an idea about this is, again, causation is a big philosophical debate for 2,000 years, maybe even more. Uh, until recently, I mean, until recently, until uh, 300 years ago. Uh, it was pretty clear because people believed in causation. Uh, in fact, if you look at the, you know, some of the philosophers from Middle Age, uh, Thomas Aquinas, and even before from Aristotle, it, it was, it's part of a fine uh, form of, uh, uh, part of philosophy, which is metaphysics. They developed a metaphysics which was based on causation. And that's how they explain, uh, you know, the causation is fundamental because there is, uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas has this, his five proofs of the existence of God, the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause, and so on and so forth. So causation was accepted 
in the philosophy by everybody, although it was kind of mysterious, but it was accepted. Uh, during Enlightenment, things changed. As you know, the Enlightenment changed a lot. Of, um, there are British empirics, and David Hume is one of the most famous. This is a very, very clever and dangerous skeptic. David Hume is a very sophisticated and skeptical uh, bad guy, I would say, for, for, for science and for other things, but he's a very sophisticated philosopher. He said this, uh, there is no causation, there are no laws, all we see are regularities we observe, and psychologically, because they repeat, we believe that there are causes. And he says, you know, the human position says there is nothing more to causality than a regular sequence of phenomenon, and it cannot give you a necessary condition, and consequently, we have no certain knowledge of causal relationships. As a consequence, causation cannot be observed. It's in our mind. Inference cannot be justified. And in causation, there are only regularities and no necessity. It's, it was a big, big thing changing in the philosophy. But he's wrong. He's wrong. So, well, I mean, he's wrong because of practical applications. If you believe him, science cannot exist if there are no laws. Anyhow, so. Where are we now in this discussion about correlation and causation? What have we learned so far? Well, we learned causation is a sophisticated concept. It's hard to define. Uh, to this debate continues if it's causation is a feature of the physical world or just a convenient way of uh, describing relationship between events. And that's important. This is a fact. We cannot measure causation. We can measure only correlations. And um, basically, he, Hume's position was supported by people because they were anti-clerical and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get into that. But it appears like causality, finding causality, it's an unsolvable problem. Well, that wouldn't be too good. How to understand and use causality? Well, causality, correlation doesn't mean causality, but where do we go from here? Uh, now, there are people recently, remember we talked about hubris, in, uh, in Greek mythology. There is hubris now with big data. There are people who believe so much in machine learning and what is happening that they say, we don't even need to talk about causation anymore. This Chris Anderson wrote a number of books. He said there is a world where massive amounts of data and applied mathematics replayed every tool. That's why people do what they do. If we understand that, how they behave and we can use that, it's good enough. Basically, uh, correlation supersedes causation. Science can advance even without coherent models. Google makes billions by ignoring causation. That's an overstretched uh, uh, statement, but it's true. A good portion of what Google and other media companies, big data company, they don't care. You know, they don't care what the cause is. So, um, but is that enough? if you don't care about causation. Well, what is the fallacy of ignoring the causation? Well, it could be that correlations, they appear to imply causation, but they might, you know, they might not be true. It might be due to chance. I don't know if you, if you know that, but uh, there is this, uh, you, you can go to this uh, site and you are gonna find some spurious correlations. And there are chance, confounding, and selection bias could be three cases you, where you can have correlation but without causation and wrong. How about this? Chocolate consumption and Nobel Prize. You probably saw that. Yeah, look at this. It appears from that that chocolate consumptions it's correlated with the number of new Nobel Prizes. So let's start eating more chocolate and people are going to get more prizes, Nobel Prizes. You see what I mean? So this is what people call spurious correlation, a correlation which is not true. Why is that true? In this case, it's, a, it's called confounding. There is a common cause. A common cause could create the impression, could create correlation, but could create the impression of causation. In other words, what actually is happening is that usually wells and location are confounded. You know, usually very rich countries, which uh, you know, they have a lot of development and uh, tradition in that, they, they live well and they eat more chocolate because chocolate you know, used to be more expensive. I don't know now, but it used to be. So, you see, this is a typical correlation which is pure, it's false, it's wrong. How about that? From that side, look at this. U.S. spending on science, space, and technology correlates extremely well with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. So we better, if we want to stop that, we should go to government and say, spend less on science, and because we have too many people which strangulate themselves. 
how about this? How about this one? Per capita cheese consumption, it correlates very well with the number of people who died become entangled in their bed sheets. Oh, this, is a, this, is a great, this guy is good. You, you might want to go to, to that site because it, it's funny. Really, you are going to like it. So, but listen, I'm talking about mathematics here. I mean, he takes real data from, from the databases. This is not, he's not in, in, in inventing it. He takes the data and looks at the data and calculates correlation and says, look at this. They are correlated. So what's happening here? What, what does it mean? Well, we need to understand exactly what... Let, let me go back here. Did I... Uh, okay, so uh, confounding, is, as I said, it's one of the causes. Otherwise, pure chance. But look at the uh, proper ways of uh, improper ways in correlation. How about confounding? If you have bias due to a common cause. For instance, this is a typical study in 1999. It happened. They published a study and said that the children under the age of two, which slept with night lights, were my, more likely to have myopia. So people say, oh, turn off the light with your kids because it's going to end up with, with need big glasses from the beginning. Well, it turned out that that was a false correlation. Why? Because other researchers found out, you see, so you have to be careful. Causation is a pretty complicated thing. You have to spend time to understand that because the parents were a common cause. Why? Because the, it, this happened that more parents who were myopic themselves, they would turn, they would keep the night lights, and by virtue of genetic inheritance, the kids were myopic anyhow, and it just happened. It was, it appeared like the lights have something to do with that, had nothing to do with that. So you see, be careful. So spurious correlation could be by chance, or it could be because of a common cause. So, uh, okay, so where do we go from here? Correlation does not need causation, okay. Uh, we know that. Uh, we just showed that. But where do we go from here? With the advent of big data, the powerful computers, now we have lots and lots of data. So is, how do we use correlation to get the correct result? How do we avoid this? You cannot, you cannot be based only on correlation because you can make a lot of mistakes. So is trying to find causal relationships useful? How do we do that? Well, here is what's happening. People solved this. They solved it very well. Um, we cannot measure causation directly, but we can measure correlation. You know, this is known. In mathematics, in statistics, it's very known. The, the, one of the Fisher's chi-score coefficient. People know how to measure correlation. As I said, causation cannot be measured, but correlation can. So, uh, we, we learned that correlation does not imply causation. But how do we find out when correlation implies causation? Sometimes it does. So how can we do that to find, the, discover the true causation? Well, this is the answer is something very nice. Randomized controlled trials, RCT. There is a, a great statistician in England, Ronald Fisher, Sir Ronald Fisher. He was ennobled, uh, a great English statistician, which found out the causation always needs, you have to actually exercise, you have to manipulate data and find out what's happening, the response to this. So. Uh, when can you do that? What, he, he actually did a lot of work in the 30s with agricultural study. So the idea of, of uh, RCT is the following. You have a number of par parameters and you keep some of them uh, constant and you start modifying one and find out the results. So you have to actually do manipulation. And if you do that, you actually can record correlation based on manipulation, which implies causation. So. This is fantastic. So this is a great answer. Uh, the, uh, after that, it was introduced in the 40s in medicine. Pretty much everything in medicine and drug development is using RCTs. Because people don't trust other. How do you know that this is exactly what's causing it? And uh, it's, it's good in many, many, many areas. Uh, but, and that's the key of what I'm trying to get with this presentation. RCTs are good. But can you use them all the time? Well, look at this. Um, sometimes, first of all, when you do drug discovery, you probably know the drug companies are spending billions, billions of, of, of dollars. It's so complicated. There are so many effects which could happen. So you have to, to do an RCT, it's going to be 
millions and millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. It's extraordinarily expensive, number one. Number two, sometimes it might not be feasible because in some cases, you know, the, the delay, you know, it takes a long time to do it. But another one is, is very important. It might be unethical. You know, it, it was a, a typical case of smoking. You know, smoking, because Fisher was involved in that. It took a long time for people to prove that the smoking is actually causing cancer. Because, you know, Fisher came up with the idea, it's a confounding thing. You might have a genetic disease, or a genetic setup in such a way that you are inclined to smoke. It's not necessarily that smoking itself is causing it. So, the point is that the only way for them to have solved that would have been, here is a group of people, and they don't smoke. You take them like a random group of people. Here is a group of people, and I'm going to force this group of people to smoke. Now, if it actually can causes cancer, that's unethical. The same thing with, uh, with uh, AIDS. I don't know if you know, but in the 80s, people, it was not clear yet that AIDS was pro uh, uh, produced by, uh, by the virus, by AIDS, by the, you know, the... Absolute HIV. It was not clear. So the only way for them to solve that would be, here is a group of people and here is a group of people, inject them with HIV and make AIDS. Well, you can't do that. In fact, it was an, uh, an American movie, very good, <laughs> with the guy. Look at this. So you actually want us to inject us with HIV? It was pretty, pretty funny. But the point is that, yes, there are many areas where RCTs cannot be used. It's unethical. And uh, so m many, many, many other things. Now, the question is, so what's left then? And this is the crux of this matter. You are left with observational studies. You are going to look at correlations. Remember, it's the only thing we can measure, correlations. Could you extract correlation from, a causation from correlation? Well, we cannot measure direct causation. Let's summarize here. Correlation are useful, but you know we need to un understand uh, causal relationship. RCTs, we know they work, but sometimes we cannot use it, so we can use only observational studies. So, correlation does not imply causation, so what's next? So, it appears like an unsolvable problem. Now, now we're moving forward in the computer science world. And this is something, it's a little bit technical, so please stay with me. There is a little bit of math. But the only reason I'm presenting the mass is we are not going to go through any proof or anything else. I just want you, this is a very sophisticated thing, by the way. And it's a recent development for the last 25 years. Extraordinarily sophisticated combination between scientists and philosophers. And the point I'm trying to make is that this is not like somebody uh, thought about it and say, oh, this is a great idea. There are extraordinary works on the mathematical level to prove it. And I'm showing the math just to show you that this is, this is work. There are books like this about that with proofs of mathematics. So all I wanted to show you what the concept, how they did it, but it's solid. It's solidly by, by uh, scientists using mathematics. So what's the idea here? How could we, we said that correlation doesn't show causation. Could we connect correlation with causation somehow? Well, we can with the advent of big data and computers. Very clever way. How it is? Well, it's the word of causal graphs. Now, mathematics knew about graphs for a long, long time. And they, do, they have a lot of good results in, in graph theories. That's the holy grail. You know, they did a lot of work. So, we want to represent a claim that one variable is the cause of another. This can be done with something which is called directed graphs. So, what's a direct graph? You know, a graph, you know, what? Oh, here is a graph, let me show you. This is a graph. These are nodes, and these are edges. And this is an undirected graph, and this is a directed graph. What is the difference? You've noticed there is an uh, arrow, and here there are no arrows. When you have no arrows, it means we have no idea about causal relationships. We know they are just relations, but we don't know the causal. In the directed graphs, you have, this means that the uh, variable A is the cause of B. And it means B is the cause of B, and so on and so forth. And there are two different graphs, and this is very important. This is the directed acyclic graph. It's a graph with directed edges. This is a directed A, but this is not acyclic in this part. 
Acyclic means that you cannot have this, like a feedback loop, you see, comes from here, go edge in this direction here and comes back. So this cannot be used. So you want to make sure that you are developing models which don't have feedback loops. If you eliminate that, that becomes a directed acyclic graph. And that's an essential thing. Okay, so this is the mass. But the only thing I want to show, these are, you know, fame, you know, people know who did probabilities, it's uh, simple. But there is a new concept which needs to be used, the conditional probability. What probability means, you know, what's the chance to get something, uh, you know, when, when the event happens. But there is another definition of another type of probability. There are two events. What is the chance of get this if the first event happened? And that's fairly well described mathematically. But what means, you, you've noticed, it's getting to a new concept of independence and conditional independence. In other words, you can have variables which are absolutely independent. So how do you do that? You, you see, the definition of conditional independence is that the probability of x given y is the same with probability at x. In other words, this is a variable x has a probability of happening. You have another variable. If they are completely independent, the, the probability of this x happening after y is happening is the same with p of x, which means they are completely independent. But if they are dependent, the probability is going to be different. So keep in mind these conditional probabilities. And then there is the famous Bayes theory, that theorem. That's why it's called the Bayesian, are called Bayesian networks. Bayes was a reverend in 1700s and so, and he created some very interesting thing. And if you are interested, it might be worth looking because there are two different approaches in understanding probabilities. One is called frequentist, and the other one is called Bayesian. There is a fundamental difference between. Sequen frequentist means like this. You, let's say you have a, a, a coin. And you say you have heads and, uh, and tails. So you throw it around. And frequentist means, OK, I'm going to throw it 100 times. I'm going to uh, count how many times was heads and how many times tails, divide. And that's probability. Well, the Bayesian is a subjective probability. It says something bigger. It, it says that, hello? OK. It, it says that I need any time I, I throw the coin again, I am updating my belief of what's happening with that. In other words, this is a little subtle here. So this is a perfectly uh, clean coin. Means uh, fair coin means that uh, the, uh, from the mechanical point of view, they are exactly the same. There are no deformations. Because if you have any deformations, it's going to have a, a, a tendency of going in one direction. But let's say it's a perfect coin. And if you throw it away and you look at, from the Bayesian point of view, it comes back, and you, you would expect that if you throw it 50%, 100 times, about 50 times would be heads, and about 50, maybe 44 and 64, or so, but very close to that. Let's say you have a coin, it comes, and nine times in a row comes heads. Well, from the point of view, from the uh, Bayesian point of view, that is, you update your belief after the eighth and the ninth one, say, this is a chance that this coin is not fair. There is something here. So that's the concept of uh, Bayesian probabilities. In general, it allows you to calculate probabilities and update whatever you know new. New information is coming and updating your uh, understanding of the system. And this is caught in this theorem here. I'm not going to go through this. But th this is an interesting thing, because Bayesian for instance, here is, here is a guy who wants to get a job offer. He got graduated, has some degrees, some, some degrees here and some experience, go to a job interview and hopefully get an offer. Okay, so that's a typical um, a Bayesian um, network, very small. So, from the mathematical point of view, the, the way to solve it is called the joint probability distribution. You look at all the combinations of all the inputs and there are probabilities here. And if you know that, you know everything about it, and you can calculate. So why are we even talking about? Well, because look at this. This is a huge amount of things, the combination which would happen. In this case, there are only four nodes, and it could, there are 23 entries. So this is a toy example. But in real examples, let's imagine you have 80 variables and 10 levels, and then the, this table would be 10 to the power of 80. Do you know what that means? 
it's estimated that the total number of atoms in the universe is 10 to 85. So it's clearly not solvable. And how to solve it? People solved it by creating this understanding of factorization into something which is called conditional probability distributions. So there is a local probability distribution here. There is conditional distribution here because this depends on this and so on and so forth. And that minimizes the number of it. It's still very complicated, for a lot to do, but mathematicians did very good work. In, for whoever is interested in, look at MC, MC Markov, uh, conditional, uh, you know, Monte Carlo simulation. They, there are a lot of good algorithms which work well. Now, how is that helping us with causation? Uh, so far, so we discussed about just a graph with some edges. How is that helping us? Well, it's helping with some idea which was different. The, uh, this, is, this is a breakthrough in the last 20 years. Judea Pearl and some of his students at UCLA, Department of Computer Science. So here you see now we're getting to a collaboration between computer science and another team of Carnegie Mellon, uh, Glymore, Spiritus, and uh, Shiners, which work on these problems. What they did, they said, the fact that we have ability to do these uh, probabilistic graphical models associated with probabilities, with joint conditional probabilities, there is something extraordinarily interesting because we can use computers now to do all kinds of interesting observations. And now we can, just looking at the graphs, we are able to understand if variables are conditionally independent or not. So the key here is conditional dependence. So this is the so-called uh, de-separation. What is de-separation? Very quickly. You see, you have some variables here. And we, from the graph, we know that x is the cause of z and y is the cause of z. So, uh, you know, this is probability model has simple factor form. We don't need to go through that. But the, uh, the idea here is that if you would have a edge been between this, they are, would be dependent. But if you don't, and you have only a connection through this, they are conditionally, could be conditional dependence. That's the key. For instance, in this case, they are completely independent. There, is no, there are no edges. And that shows that the probability of this is the product of probabilities, individual probabilities. But in another one, in a causal chain, so here is what they did. They are associating a graphical model with what's happening with the probabilities and going to derive some essential implications from this. In this case, for instance, says, oh, look, look, at, look at this. If we observe this probability here, uh, these guys are dependent otherwise. If you look at this, this is a, a chain like this interview and job offer. You would expect to be between experience and job offer to be, you know, correlated. The guy has more experience, he's going to have a better probability to get the job offer. The interesting part is, if you condition, if you go and know about the job interview results, it makes them independent. How is that possible? Well, it's very simple. Look at the probability to get an offer, experience is one, and if you get an interview, and you say that the interview was pretty good, it's another probability here, and now you look at the probability of experience being very good, the probability stays the same. In other words, if you know the, what happened, the result of this, it decouples these two variables. So this is very important because graphically, you now you know that graphically, if you condition on the one in the middle for this type of connection, you are going to get conditional independence. Uh, the same thing is for co common causes. It's exactly the same thing. You condition on this, they become conditionally independent. But this is different in the so-called collider. It's the, uh, the V structure. In other words, this would be a V structure. An interesting case. You see, for instance, uh, you, you, probability of getting a job interview, uh, of, of experience, for instance, let's say it's 0.4. If you look at the probability of getting experience and get a good interview, the probability goes up because the interview was good. So the probability of having experience is pretty high up. That's why the guy got a good interview. The probability, now we're adding to the prop the fact that he has bad grades. You've not happened? So we're looking at the probability experience like before, interview was good, and the grades are bad. 
the probability that went up. Why? Well, it appears like the guy had such extraordinary experience that the fact that he had bad grades doesn't matter. You understand the complexity of these Bayesian networks allows you, there are all kinds of probabilistic connections between them, and by being able to calculate them, you understand something about the conditional dependence and independence. So in this case, if you condition, if you know the result of this, they become dependent. They used to be independent. Degree score and experience are interconnected. You. Anyhow, so based on that, this is the summary, basically. Uh, it, it means, it says that the, the chain is inactive, it passes through. In these cases, if you uh, condition on Z, they become independent. In this case, if you don't condition on Z, they are independent, they become dependent uh, if you condition on Z. Anyhow, so the, the point is, I want, I'm, I'm very close to finishing it, so I'm, I'm, thank you for staying with me. I, I, I believe that the, the, the drinks help, so. You know, you count, count you down, so <laughs> that's good. So here is where we are now. So what happened, basically? <clears throat> uh, the computer science and the philosophical community, they teamed up. And that's something rare. I'm going to show you at the end. This is not happening in other areas. So what was left now is to do causal, causal discovery. And they basically, from a philosophical point of view, what they did, they created something which is called computation epistemology of causal science. Epistemology, it's another term in philosophy which says the knowledge. So they were able, so remember what I said at the beginning, it's so complicated with causality, they didn't know how to go about it, but they added probabilities and they added computational part, and they were able to find a way out. That's why they call it computational epistemology, a way of knowing based on the computer science through the connections with the Bayesian graphs brought something new, quality new. So what did they do? Well, the next step is to use this disseparation to extract causation, causality, from, uh, from uh, correlation only. So remember. Correlation is, doesn't imply causation, but it could, and there is a way, if we apply this methodology, to find if there is causation, causality or not. This is pretty amazing what these people did. So you start, just quickly, start with a general graph, do age elimination, I'm going to show you an example, and then you do orientation. So basically, here it how it works. This is the real, the real graph, which you know that this is the truth. And people get data about that, which are data about the variables, you know, random variables. So how do you, because people developed an algorithm on computers to extract causality. What they want to extract is this connection between this. And they start with a undirected graph, which doesn't know anything about causality, in which it's called a complete graph, which means every node is connected with every other node. So now the first phase for us is to eliminate the ages which are not there if you have a causality uh, relationship. And we know that this is the truth here, so we know that these edges have to disappear. So how do we do that? Well, it's very simple what they do. It's, uh, you know, they look at the disseparation, you know, look at the connection between uh, conditional independence between this. And, uh, you know, in, in this case, look at the B and C and they were disseparated by A, so that means that there is no direct connection between them. So eliminate this edge. So we eliminated. The same thing is Hamana Kum, remove the BC edge. Now you, you move into A and, and E. So we had another edge between A and E. But you look at A, D, E, and you've calculated the correlations and look at the disseparation as I showed before, and this shows by calculating it that there is independence, conditional independence between them, which means you can remove this and so on and so forth. So you just remove all this, and at one point you say, okay, now I kind of know the structure, but I need to orient the edges because I want to show the, the, you know, the causality. So the best thing for that is like this. It says, when we did the correlation between them, we found out that when we looked, we condition on D, it makes them not independent, the, the opposite, it makes them dependent, which means that this is what we call the collider. So it means that this, the uh, arrows are like this. The other ones are not colliders, and slowly you go and you finish this without any intervention, just from correlations. So, almost there. Concluding remarks. 
causation was and still is a difficult philosophical problem. We talked about what they to, to, to these people. By the way, philosophers are still arguing that the Hume is right, but you know, not, not practical. Uh, correlation doesn't imply causation, we talked about that. Uh, we know that the clear solution to finding causation from correlation is to actually do interventions. And this is called RCT and works very well when it works. But in many cases, it's too big, too complex, costs too much money, sometimes it's unethical, so you cannot do that. And people said, listen, we would like to do something different because we have this extraordinary computational capabilities. We'd like to see if we can get causation just from correlations. And indeed, but bringing these DAGs, you know, direct acyclic graphs and Bayesian networks and so on and so forth, and the tremendous, by the way, this is very computationally intensive. I forgot to mention, uh, as you could imagine, uh, that couldn't not be done 20, 30 years ago because you can't, you can't solve this. But with the, this tremendous, uh, you know, uh, possibilities of computers now, we can do that. And that gave this extraordinary new epistemology of, connect, of causation, as uh, philosophers are, are uh, you know, uh, calling it. And this helped people in many, many areas. These are some of the areas uh, in, in which they did, you know, medicine, drug development, forensic, it's a lot, a lot of work. People are working everywhere on that because it's the only way you can obtain causation in, from observational studies. There are so many areas where you cannot do RCTs, you cannot do anything else. And if this is successful and it started being successful, it's a lot of work. It helps in very many areas. For instance, you know, you, you just look at that. People want to make government needs to make a policy, uh, you know, connection. If we are going to do this, what's going to happen? What is the result of this? You, you can't actually implement that. So you need to have a good model of this causation in order to be able to understand what's happening. Well, before I finish, I just wanted to tell you that this is a, a remarkable cooperation between uh, philosophical teams, you know, and computer scientists. Uh, in other areas, and that is a big subject, but I just wanted to touch because to show contrast between what these people did, these did joint work. In other areas, there is a lot of mistrust recently between scientists and philosophers, and that's not good. For a typical example, I don't know if you heard, again, I'm going to mention Hawking, you know, Krause, these people wrote books in which uh, Hawking said, you know, philosophy is a disgrace. What have they done? What have they achieved for 2,000 years? They are still talking about the same problems and so on and so forth. So uh, there is a, a, a big disconnect has to do with metaphysics of science and philosophy. And uh, I'm not going to cover that because this is a very big subject. I'm telling you that it creates a very, uh, you know, the, the mood in the scientific community and philosophy is not too good as far as particle physics is, is concerned. So that's why I am pretty happy that we found a, a, an area which is extremely successful, is brand new, with a lot of creativity, and it's due to people like Judea Pearl and, as I said, the Carnegie Mellon uh, group, and they kind of invented that and solved the problem in a, in a major way. Thank you very much. Come on, everybody. Give it up for Dan Cortez. So uh, it's a dangerous uh, option to provide to the audience, but with such a bright, energetic bunch of people here, I, I would like to give them the opportunity to ask you a few questions. Uh, please, please do. Dan, are you up for it? Absolutely. Okay, so worlds have collided. There's been all sorts of themes coming together. Um, I want to hand... It to you, who's got some questions for Dan Cordes? Who wants to delve into the mind where these two worlds meet? Yes, sir. <laughs> 
do you make the assumption that they are evil? Or you are just giving some examples? Well, if, if people have done through through history terrible things, and we're creating sometimes, it, sometimes yes, um, but if, and sometimes they've done wonderful things. That's true. Yes, if we create a general intelligence that is exact, like human beings or whatever, it could be capable of uh, capable of that. So, shouldn't we want to create a general intelligence or a super intelligence that's greater than ourselves? and more benevolent than ourselves, and how is that possible? Great question. And uh, has, there are some philosophical assumptions behind it. <laughs> uh, no, but you, you kind of assumed that we actually can create this super intelligence. As, according to the transhumanists, they might develop themselves in a way which, especially if they go to what they call singularity, we may not be able to even comprehend. There, is a, there are a lot of theories about how come, I don't know if you know the Fermi paradox. Have you heard about the Fermi paradox? Enrico Fermi was a great computer scientist in, in quantum mechanics and, and so on and so forth. And uh, he was a very clever common sense guy also. Uh, and uh, at one point he said, that was in the 60s and 70s where everybody said, uh, uh, well, we are going to set these programs to find the extraterrestrials, you know. We're going to hear, we're going to listen to uh, antennas and all. So and it's been 40 years, 30 years, nothing happened. And even in that time, and Fermi said, if life is supposed to be so prevalent in the world, how come we never heard about them? So this is a fair question. How come, look at how many years on, we're trying. One, and there are a number of people who are trying to come up with speculations, why not? One of them, I'm not gonna go through that because it's a long list, but one of them is that this, maybe we are surrounded by, the, the universe has been around much longer than the Earth. The Earth has been around, what, four billion years. The universe has been 16, 14 billion, you know. So an assumption could be, yes, there is extraordinary uh, intelligence. It's so extraordinary, more advanced than us, we can't even, you know, how would you communicate with a worm? You, we, you know, humans with a worm. Maybe there is a, a connection like that. So from this point of view, the transhumanists, to answer your question, they believe that we might not be able to control that. However, there are a number of people among the transhumanists, and one of them is Andrew Bostrom. Remember the name if you are interested here? wrote a book called Superintelligence about three years ago. Very, very good book if you are interested in answering this question. Because that, that his position, he says, he analyzes a number of cases when this superintelligence could come up. And he said, but meanwhile, we are developing some of the software which are going to do that. Maybe we could put in the software some conditions to avoid that. And he goes through some of the cases, but is not clear that you, we can actually do it. But he is very detailed in trying to answer that. And indeed, from this point of view, I believe it's good that people are thinking about it. Because even if, you know, uh, if you ask me right now, I'm not so sure that a singularity is going to happen, you know, as Kurzweil and these people are, are, are talking about. But we humans, right now where we are with all this development, we definitely, we are up to some surprises because we have too much complexity. Even if it's not going to be a super intelligence, so much complexity, if anything could go wrong with connections we don't know about, that could be bad. So yes, this kind of thinking in the, in the complicated software are putting together, we might need to put some conditions in, in the way we design it to alleviate for some potential bad things happening. Yes. Why would a super intelligence need to be like a human? But that's what they say, might not be like. That's what they, that, this is the whole idea of singularity. You know, the idea of singularity means that we don't know. And if you read, uh, I don't have it, Vernon Vinge, that's exactly what they say. It's going to be something which is beyond our comprehension. And the point they, together with Kurzweil, are making is that we have to be very worried because he talks about Kurzweil about this accelerated uh, law of accelerated returns. He says because of this, it could happen so fast that before we wake up, they are going to be there and where we, we can do anything. And it's connected to, to his question also. You know, maybe whatever we do right now to try to get there, maybe we are able to put some hooks in. But if they are super intelligent indeed, they are going to ignore us. Possibly. The other thing is the whole causality thing. Mm -hmm. 
are not mostly researchers and philosophers interested in causality and are, let's say, us mere mortals actually not using causality all that no. much? No. Let me, let me give you an example. No, let me give you an example. Eighty percent of uh, it, human decisions is based on what does my friend think about it? No, but, but, but you see, here is, here is an extraordinarily interesting, that's a very good point. Because a lot of people are thinking about that. You go back to the physics. You go back to this extraordinary development of human mind, physics. I mean, starting with Newton and, you know, even now today. If you look at every equation in physics, there is no directed arrow. There is no, you cannot do causality. F equal MA, who's, who's cause and who's effect? For some reason, during development of physics, people did not feel like that it was a need to put that into the mathematical formalism. This is a very recent thing where people said, we need to create, and this is coming from Judea Pearl, the really deep thinker says, it, it stopped people from actually doing right things with causality. There is no language. There is no mathematical language to do it. So, yeah, it's surprising. But it's true, you know, in, if you look at the, the barometer, you know, the barometer is connected with the, the, the storm coming. Is the, the storm coming? If you look at the barometer, it's a linear relationship. So, is the storm coming the barometer to move or is the barometer causing the storm? Is the, is the uh, sunrise uh, making the, the uh, rooster crow? Or is the, the, the crow, you know, the, the rooster crowing bring the signs up? What if the, the rooster doesn't want to decide not to do it? The sun might not come up. In mathematics right now, there is no causality in the formality. And that's what they are trying to do with these approaches because clearly it's limiting. It's not good. Okay, a few more questions. Here. All right, sir. There is a gentleman in the back also after that, make sure that he, he tried for a while, you don't see him. So, I have a question, it depends from that, because uh, we were talking about narrow intelligence, going to general intelligence and then super intelligence, uh -huh. which if we apply what we saw today, means that there, there, there will most likely be no connection between narrow, narrow intelligence and super intelligence. Well, n narrow intelligence is supposedly eventually is going to lead to artificial yes. general intelligence. Exactly. So, at the same time, where does bias fit into the equation? Because, okay, there is a cause, you know, and the causality between two, uh, two effects or two events or two mm -hmm. phenomena. But at the same time, how do you measure and how can you quantify the, the effect of bias? Yes, well, good question. And how it could, Well, uh, the idea is that, and that's exactly the, the concept. Right now, m most machine learning right now, most of the machine learning per se, it's like the equation in the physics. There is nothing in machine learning with the direction of causality. It's all correlation. Look at all the algorithm. It's all correlation. So that's the point of these people who are working on causality say, it's not enough. We need to bring causality. And Judea Perlund, he has the so-called the do calculus. If you are interested in, look at the do calculus. It's, uh, what he needs to do is he says, we need a new mathematical description, which is similar to what I presented here with this separation. But I didn't have time to go into uh, what he calls manipulation. If you want to bring causality, there are three levels you need to bring, uh, you know, manipulation, handling that. You need to also talk about confounding and common cause and confounding. And to do that, he created a special calculus probability in which he looks at how the, the graphics changes in order to bring causality. So exactly the point is, people claim there are no causal models. And if we, without causal models, you can't have a robot who's going to be close to, our, to, to a human. Because without causality, there is no, you know, you're not going to be able to have somebody who thinks like, like human mind. So yes, it's missing. That's, that's the reason I believe it was so important. I wanted to talk about it. It's ignored. It's still very much ignored. OK, we got a question at the back there. Hey. Um, Thanks so much. Quick question. Where does, actually, it's not a quick question. But, uh, where, where do you think ethics com, comes in? So let's say we, we solve the causality and correlation problem, and we can uh, precisely say what causes what. Um, so let's just say all the epistemological and metaphysical questions are being solved. We're still left with ethical questions. So let's take your examples of getting a job. If you have the right experience and the right degrees, you get a job. 
But then ethics comes in as like, is getting a job good or bad? <laughs> and um, and what's you 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 get you're left with ethical questions. Um, and I'm wondering where do you stand here? Uh, uh, how are so exactly the question is how ethics how, is, how does ethics play a part in creating the general <coughs> artificial intelligence and where because you still need a purpose for those machines and in all even like the the, the 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 deep AI they still get a purpose and there are thinkers out there I mean like uh, I know males and the utilitarians who believe that you can derive the morality from utility. Um, I'm, I'm wondering where do you stand and if you think we can create an ethics out of morality because if we can, then we're not that far away. I mean, look at um, uh, the open AI games against uh, the best Dota players, uh, which is a, a very famous game, multiplayer game where you move a character around. And the only axiom that the uh, programmers put into the AI was that that, uh, that life of the character is preferable to death. And then the AI discovered the rules of the game and played the game so that he can live longer. And if you are to believe, I don't know, like males and all the other utilitarians, <clears throat> having a few axioms like life is preferable to death, Pleasure is preferable to pain. Based on those axioms, let's say there are limited number, we can derive an ethics that we can put at the foundation of these AIs, assuming that we solve the correlation causality okay. issue. So where do you stand on that? Well, as I mentioned the name of uh, uh, Nick Bostrom, he covered that in his book, by the way. You're right. There are very serious implications about that, and it's not easy to solve. But I. You, you see, if we talk about at this level, this is not artificial super intelligence, you know, and this game and doing that. Indeed, it all depends on the conditions, how, how the programmers, you know, thought about that and you know, I end up with something ethic or not ethics. But when we go to artificial super intelligence, this is an important thing to talk about when all this hype is about super intelligence, what they are going to do. Ethics has to do with us has to do with consciousness. There is no ethics beyond our consciousness. And the reason I mentioned that is that one of the things which could come up of, out of this development of artificial superintelligence, as opposed to a lot of people believing there are going to be these beings which are going to be more intelligent, there might be bad or good toward us, it might be something which philosophers called the philosophical zombies, which means I mean, it's extraordinarily sophisticated in terms of syntactic and answering and behaving like that. They might not have any consciousness. We still don't know what consciousness is and what's producing consciousness. We still don't know if doing this extraordinary work is going to end up with some consciousness. It might be, among other options, a philosophical zombie. It could be a machine which is very sophisticated, does all kinds of things, could kill people and do that just as a you know, without any ethics. That's the point I'm trying to make. So this is a very complex thing. And by the way, even beyond talking about that, I would say I am less worried about the ethics in this. I believe that among the, the three technologies the transhumanists are main, mentioning, which they believe that, you know, uh, the confluence of these three technologies are going to create this, uh, you know, super uh, transhuman, the one which we, humans, now are going to see the effects sooner is genetics. I didn't have time to talk about that, but genetics is very, very dangerous. Very quickly, we are approaching things where people are be able to change our genetical makeup. I don't know how familiar you are with the DNA, DNA which is the, the, uh, the support for our, the, the framework for everything which the, the, the living organism is developing. And this is based, it's like a code basically. But they're very small at the molecular level. Well, people said that, oh, they, they talked about four years, so we're going to change the DNA, maybe do that. But it was no way, because the DNA is so small. When you, when you think about changing, you think about the surgeon comes and cuts you. This is macro level. At that level, it was impossible. Guess what? And a lot of people were totally surprised. 
There is a new technology in which now, in the last three years only, it's called CRISPR-Cas9. I don't know if anybody... Uh, this just came out of nowhere in which they found bacteria who did that, and people immediately took it and developed an editing, a gene editing program, which is available right now. I don't know if it's commercial, but it's in some universities, Harvard and... So, basically, you actually can go in and create kind of a surgery for DNA. Well, this could be used for very good things. I don't know if you know, there are some uh, terrible genetical disease, uh, diseases. Some of them have multiple genes, but there is one of them which is really, really terrible. It's called the Huntington disease. Huntington disease is nothing else than just an information uh, repetition, uh, repetition in the DNA, which is wrong. They're adding two more uh, repeats. And if somebody is born, it's perfectly normal. And it's, you know, has a happy childhood and grows smart and so on and so forth. By the time they be like mid 30s, this extraordinary atrophy is happening and there is nothing you can do. They are going to die. It's a genetic disease. Well, imagine this potentially could be such a simple thing. You go with this gene editing thing, the embryo, and cut it and make it perfect. That would be great. Well, but how many other bad things can happen? Frankenstein and all these things where you could, people could go and do genetic changes for all kinds of purposes, speaking of ethics, with people with ethics, but they are bad people, they have bad ethics, you don't know. So I believe that there is an immediate danger, much more than artificial intelligence, in genetics being used in, in, in the wrong way. And hard, it's going to be hard to, to, to be contained. Good evening. I, I'm not sure if it's... Uh cause of a correlation, but you, you did a bit of a, an adrenaline rush earlier to me, so it's probably a cause, so you're, you're the cause of something that happened to me, so that's good. Now, uh, well, we, need, we need to prove on RCT. I, no observation. <laughs> oh, just, observation only, okay. okay. No, I have a more, more of a philosophical question. Yeah. Um, presuming, so that we presume that the artificial intelligence, the super, or the artificial intelligence that you're talking about, it's 20, 50, a, th a thousand years from now. Now, there's something else that we might still have them then, and presumably we'll have that as well, uh, is religion mm -hmm. uh, and ethics. A variety of ethics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel or what do you feel, not think? What Connection with religion. Is the rela yeah. the, the co what could the causes of the super AI can have on religion and vice versa, of okay. but also the ethics of uh, this new type of AI that can be developed. Thanks. Great question. By the way, uh, again, we don't have time for all this, but uh, there is a strong implications of what transhumanism thinks about religion. There is a, they are writing a lot. I'm just going to give you some of them because there, there is a, uh, one of the transhumanists, you know, one of, there are a few of them which are famous, and he's kind of almost there, Giulio Prisco. And Giulio Prisco is very much concerned with, uh, uh, with uh, religion in, uh, in transhumanism. Now, if we go back to philosophy and religion, you know, we know what people think about religion and uh, supernatural and the God and everything else. And, you know, there are all kinds of discussions about that. But the transhumanists, they believe, and Giulio Prisco believes, they replace religion with transhumanism. This is an interesting thing. And he said that he has some, some of the rules. This is a very complicated, I don't know if we can, how far, I'm going to try to be short about that. They have some rules. They say that, first of all, to the question, uh, is transhumanism a religion or not? Prisco says yes and no. <laughs> what he means by the no, he says no, because we do not believe in supernatural. So leaving that aside. But we are going to become the gods. Remember the part says, yes, it is a religion because we are going to develop these extraordinary uh, superior technologies that for the other people, it's going to appear, and this is connected to are we living in a simulation or not? You know, you saw the movie Matrix. A lot of people in, in this area, they say, we are living in a simulation. And, you know, people talk about God, you know, look at Aquinas and people, well, it's a programmer who, you know, is, is programming us. And we're talking about miracles, the guy just intervened and did something. In other words, they say, it's what's called the third law of Arthur Clarke, you know, the Odyssey, everything 
which is suffic sufficiently technological advanced appears like a miracle. There is no difference between magic and that. So they say, we are going to create this so extraordinary technology that it's going to appear like, like a miracle, like religion, basically. So there is a strong belief in among some of them that uh, transhumanism, if it happens, uh, they believe it happens, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be replace a religion. There is a guy, Tipler, talks about the Omega point. It, it becomes too much speculation, so let, let's stop it here. But it is a very strong connection. Okay, I know there's probably a lot of questions. But, you know, we could take more because they had the wine before. So, you know, before it was much more difficult last well, year. Well, how about this? Should we go for one lucky last question? One lucky last question. Who, who has a real, real lucky last question? Who's got... Who's we got a mic at the back. Oh, okay. It's in the back, in the back. Mr. Sebastian. Burja, if you, yep, Sebastian. Perfect. Sebastian, yeah. Well, thanks very much on behalf of all of us, Professor, for this amazing presentation. Um, the question has to deal with the future of government and how all of this... Oh, oh no, don't tell me. Oh, oh no, 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 I'm not no, answering. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. And obviously, just like previous questions, I know this could be the subject for a full semester course or sure. maybe a PhD thesis. <coughs> Which it is, yeah. Absolutely. But just a couple of thoughts on where you think... About, about what? I'm, I'm sorry, what's the question specifically? Basically, where is government going in the context of oh, all this? Is the what, what's, what are they doing? What they should do? Yeah. Oh, this and, is... And, and, you know, how far away are, from, are we from the, the moment okay. when we'll elect a supercomputer to govern us? Because it's certainly going to be better than some of the people I know. Okay. I, I, I'm going to... As far as I... Right now, the government doesn't do much, except they are investing a lot of money in, in military stuff. And that in itself, I don't know what that means. Could be good or bad, but definitely could be a, a bad price. So I'm going to come back to genetics, because I think this is more, it's, it's closer to what we, as individuals, can fear and see what the government is doing. And I, 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 I want to I phrase it this way. We, usually people blame governments and many times be blamed, but in that, this is so complicated. For instance, what should the government do with regulating genetics development, if anything? There are lots of books written about that. Francis Fukuyama, if you, are, you, should, you should read that, it's very well, it's a short book. It's not, no, only the government, it's people. What do we want to do? I'll give you an example. And it's a it's a very, it's a terrible in, inversion of, of things. You know about eugenics. Eugenics is a bad term. You know what eugenics is? Eugenics is, is something which was invented, you know, way back in the 19th century and said that people who are uh, not to the level of the others, we should do something that they should not have kids. That was, you know, England, you know, Galton and many others. That was bad because, especially after the Second World War, because the, uh, the Nazis, uh, you know, uh, abused it, became like a terrible word. And people say, no, governments should do that because they sterilized people and they did this and that. And what was a terrible thing, government intervention. And by the way, not only the Second World War, until the 60s and 70s, people were still sterilizing people in Sweden, in Canada, in the United States. So, eugenics is bad. So we all know that. Let me tell you something, which is very, very interesting. With the advent of genetics, eugenics is going to come back on the back door. Eugenics, the way we understood, was bad because it was imposed, forced upon people by somebody, you know, groups or whatever, or the government. So people said, no, that's bad. But when you have genetics and other drugs, which can transform you, uh, should the people have the right to use them? Should the people, for instance, if there is a drug you can do, or, or some sort of a addition to the brain, the electronics and everything else, or changing in the, in the genetics that somebody could create, have a better, a kid with better uh, cognitive, uh, you know, uh, capabilities? Well, who's gonna answer that? You see, you've noticed as a being top down, this becomes a bottoms up because the parents, and there is a big movement of people, some people 
we should not uh, allow them. But people say, why? Why do you want to prohibit me when, when I have the capability? I want to do that. I, my duty as a parent is to allow the kid to, to have the best possibility. So eugenics is creeping back. So then all the, the, the social, societal problems we faced before and killed a lot of people to equalize. People are going to, you know, that's what the communists try to do. Trying to do social engineering and killed millions of people to equalize them. They are now again, with these changes, they are going to become even more, more uh, uh, unequal. So the question is, what can the government do with that? Should they stop it or not? So I'm saying, and um, I'm old enough that I don't care too much, I'm not going to be around, but for you, this is going to be a big problem, a societal problem, and I don't believe there are in the society the, the uh, institutions and the processes to handle that right. I believe it's going to be a big, before artificial intelligence and supercomputers, this is going to be a big hitter much sooner. All right, okay, ladies and gentlemen, you. more than enough toys. Would you please again show your thank you. fondness for Mr. Dan Cordes? Okay.